Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Friday morning of um, the Skoll Global Forum. Thank you for braving another gorgeous spring morning <laughs> in the United Kingdom uh, to be here for a, a very early start. My name is Andy Whitehouse. It's my great pleasure to be the moderator of this session this morning on, uh, delivering strategy, on delivery strategies for the base of the pyramid. Um, in recent years, a lot has been written. I think understanding has moved dramatically in terms of uh, the development of products and services to serve uh, consumers at the base of the pyramid. And at the same time, I think quite a lot has been uh, written. There's been a lot of talk about um, the process of getting those products and services to market. We know, we know the examples, Coca-Cola, supply chains, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a great piece by Andrew Jack in the FT just a couple of weeks ago on this. Um, but a sense that even though perhaps the optimization of product development has come quite a long way, that there's much further to go in terms of optimizing approaches towards the delivery of products and services to, uh, to, to the communities that need them most. Um, so that was the inspiration behind uh, the panel that we're going to have this morning. Um, to underline that, uh, the president of the World Bank recently has given speeches, and there's an article in the, uh, the publication in front of you where he argues for the need for a science of delivery. Uh, learnings about the implementation of uh, delivery strategies to get products and services to the base of the pyramid. Learnings about uh, the sorts of skills that make uh, delivery more effective. And so our challenge today as a group with this illustrious panel and with uh, uh, an extraordinary group of people in the room is to explore that topic. How it is that we can make more effective uh, the process of delivering products and services to the base of the pyramid. So in the session, we'll, we'll discuss at least three things. We'll discuss how leaders can ensure that promising innovations and basic commodities do not fail in the last mile to the consumer due to the costs and challenges of delivery. We'll hear how organizations can distribute and build awareness, demand and uptake for these goods without going broke. And we'll identify strategic, operational and marketing considerations for bottom for base of the pyramid markets, including partnerships, branding, customer segments, and adoption. I'd like to propose that we use the next, um, let's say, hour or so as follows. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce our extraordinary group of panelists and invite them to tell us a little bit about the organizations that they lead and to offer some reflections on their experiences, uh, positive and otherwise, in seeking to deliver products and services to the base of the pyramid. Then I'd like us to get into a bit of debate uh, as soon as possible involving everybody in the room, uh, if it's all right. I have that, I sort of subscribe to that view on panels where a bit like the best kind of weddings where there's always dancing before the food. Um, so uh, I'd be, I'll ask questions if, um, if you guys would like, but I'd be even more excited about um, us getting into a debate amongst us uh, with, with the panel and amongst uh, everybody in the room as soon as we can. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, reflections, ideas about what we can do to improve the quality of practice uh, around the effective delivery of, uh, of products and services to the base of the pyramid. Now let me introduce our speakers. We have an extremely distinguished panel to get us started in what I hope will be a very interactive session. Um, starting from the very far end, um, Anurag Merrill. Anurag is the program leader for the Technology Solutions Global Program at PATH. He leads projects at PATH that focus on technologies for diagnostics, maternal, neonatal, and reproductive health, water and sanitation, health management information systems, and vaccines and immunizations. Anurag teaches at Stanford, worked previously for Johnson & Johnson, and is a graduate of Berkeley, University of Colorado Boulder, and the IIT, IIT Bombay. He's the holder of seven patents and has more than 20 publications to his name. Uh, next, uh, along is Selena Chu. Uh, Selena is Managing Director of, um, of Bayer in Thailand and the group country head for the North ASEAN region. And I understand is the first Asian woman to head up any con country office uh, for, for Bayer. Uh, prior to Selena's current role, she worked as a lawyer in China for 18 years. And she is a graduate of the University of Western Australia and uh, the University of Hong Kong. Uh, next, uh, uh, next along is, um, is Jordan Caslow. Jordan is the founder and co-chair of Vision Spring. Previously, Jordan founded the Global Health Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. 
He is both a Skoll and an Ashoka Fellow and a Henry Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute. Jordan earned a Doctorate of Optometry from the, New from the New England College of Optometry and his MPH at Johns Hopkins. And he's been named one of Forbes Impact 30 Top, tw top 30 Social Entrepreneurs. And last but not least, next to me is Debbie Aung Ding Taylor. Debbie is a co-founder of Proximity Designs, a non-profit social enterprise which makes and sells products that provide a path out of poverty for rural families. Debbie has worked for nonprofit organizations, local community groups, USAID, the United Nations, and the World Bank. Uh, like me, she's a graduate of Harvard and has received both the Skoll Foundation Award and the Schwab Foundation Award for social entrepreneurship. Please welcome our panel. So I'd like to get things started by turning to Anurag, and, uh, and I'm gonna ask each of our panelists the same question. Basically, to tell us a little bit about the approach that their organization takes, uh, what it is that they do, and, uh, it, and particularly how they think about delivering products and services uh, to the base of the pyramid. And in that context, to say a little bit about um, what they believe to be either their biggest learning or their biggest achievement in serving this really important group. So, Anna. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I work for PATH, which is uh, a global health organization. It's a nonprofit. Uh, has pl five platforms, vaccines, drugs, uh, diagnostics, tools and devices, and community <coughs> intervention. Um, we are known to be uh, innovators in, in global health, um, coming up with new solutions that uh, address these uh, challenging problems. Uh, but what we are not known for, but we do, uh, is taking those solutions all the way to market. We work very closely with partners. In terms of the way we do this, uh, we heavily depend on partnerships across, across the world um, at every stage of pro uh, technology development and, and implementation, uh, right from the ideas, sourcing of the ideas, to working on developing those ideas, testing in the field, and then ultimately, ultimately uh, introducing them in the marketplace, and then following up uh, to see if uh, impact is being made or not. We depend heavily on the partnership. We also depend on support from a wide range of uh, donors and, and organizations, including the country organizations and, uh, and uh, the foundations like the Gates Foundation. Oh, uh, I think the question was about what was the, the, the biggest success? I think there are the number of things that we have done. We, we are a 35-year-old organization. Perhaps one of the earliest successes that we had, which also has made one of the greatest impacts, is vaccine vial monitor. H how many of you have seen a vaccine vial? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, there's a little dot on that vaccine vial uh, that actually tells you when it has not been in cold chain long enough, when it has actually been out of the cold chain. Well, that was invented by PATH and was implemented in the marketplace with, with a variety of partners. Uh, and, and now it's actually on every single vaccine vial. Uh, there are other technologies that we've been introduced, uh, we have introduced. Uh, one of the latest ones is, is a safe water technology in Cambodia, which I think ta I'll talk about later in the, in the discussion. Great, thank you, Anurag. Selena? I'm for Bayer, which is a for-profit organization. Um, I think most people know Bayer as um, a healthcare uh, pharmaceutical business or a crop science business. But we also have a material science business which deals with high-tech uh, polymers and polycarbonates and engineering plastics. And the inclusive business model that we are, we are going to share with you today, called Sunrise, uh, comes from the material science part of our business. So for material science, we make um, polycarbonate, polyurethane, insulation materials, um, polyisocyanates that go into things you touch every day. So mobile phones, mini bars in your hotel room, mattresses, auto cars. And as you can see, this goes into fairly high-end markets. Sunrise is an inclusive business initiative that uh, Biomaterial Science um, has put together in order to reach further down the pyramid and also to align business interests with uh, social interests. In order to do this, we obviously need to find new and different applications for our uh, products, our materials. And maybe the best thing to do is to give you a couple of examples of other solutions uh, we have in mind or we've been working on. We have about four or five, but probably two are quite helpful to understand. The first is uh, we make polyurethane, which is super insulation material. Uh, we supply to fridge companies, uh, fridge manufacturers, construction. But uh, we're so good at it that we can actually make fridge doors or fridge walls very thin so you can get more beer and more food into your fridge. <laughs> but if we can do that, we were thinking, why can't we deliver a low-cost cold storage solution to farmers or rural communities who are off-grid or who don't have access to power? 
And that's sort of how some of these ideas came about. We think that is good for society, we have social benefits, because farmers waste a lot of their crop through rotting, about 30%, we understand. If they had cold storage in villages, they could save some of their hard work. Also, it would put less pressure on them in terms of selling their produce to, let's say, intermediaries who have cold storage access. And they could sell at the timing they wanted, have more control, more power and um, at prices they are happy with. So that's one solution we've been working on quite successfully. Another solution is a uh, solar dryer. So we also make polycarbonate. I think we invented it. It's a high resistant, high impact resistant, clear plastic material that you can find on headlamps, uh, CD material, um, you know, uh, glazing for facades. But it's also very good for making solar dryers that use no external energy generation in order to dry food. So it's just purely uh, sun. And we thought that if you can save wastage of food through cooling, you could also do it through drying. And if you go travel through Southeast Asia or even other countries, you see that that's a lot of a big drying tradition for food. But they dry it on the roads and that's dust and pollution and crab all over it. Um, and it doesn't make for a hygienic uh, product at the end. So if you can dry it in an enclosed space, you can make it hygienic. And also you are not so subject to the vagaries of weather. If the rain comes, the crop is destroyed. And apart from just sort of stopping or reducing wastage, it also, it seems to us, um, creates a new income stream for the farmers in that um, we work with Professor Sum at the Silipal Khan University in Bangkok. And his research shows that if you have one raw banana, that rots quite easily, you can sell it for 33 cents baht, a Thai, Thai currency. If you dry it on the road, you can sell it for one baht. So it's like a threefold increase already. If you dry it in the solar dry hygienically, you can sell it for 10 baht. If you, if you chocolate dip it, dip it in chocolate, which I've seen it done, wrap it individually and package it in some attractive packaging, you can extract 30 baht for it. And I bought this myself at high-end supermarkets in Bangkok. So suddenly, a banana becomes a lot more valuable to the farmer if they can access these solutions. So that's kind of what we're working on. And I know this discussion is on delivery. And we, we, I must confess that we haven't really delivered a lot commercially to the market because we find, it, uh, we find a number of issues uh, in terms of delivery. And maybe I can just quickly go through a couple. First, we're a raw material supplier. So the product that goes to market is not our product. It's somebody else's product that uses our materials. So when we do road shows, we pitch, we talk to governments about the use of this product, it's actually somebody else's product and we need to work with partners that are like-minded. Also, when these products, um, so the solar dryer or the cool cold room, have problems in terms of after-sale service, it's not actually our product, we can't service it. So we have these issues in terms of delivery. We also have a uh, lack of knowledge of this market, for sure, um, and at the bottom of the pyramid. It's not one of our normal demographics. So we need to partner with people there. And also, in order to make the solution useful for the farmer, somebody needs to help him market the banana at the end. And as buyer, we have no idea how to market a solar dried banana. So we need to actually get marketing expertise in. So the big learning, I guess, in to answer to your question, is that we really need to partner. And finding partners is not easy. It's, um, as, as my, my uh, colleague says, it's like kissing frogs. So that's kind of like my role, to kiss a whole bunch of frogs to find you know, a partner that works for us. So that's our story so far. Great. Thank you, Selena. Jordan? Thank you. Vision Spring works to ensure affordable access to eyewear everywhere. Uh, we are an organization that designs and develops eyeglasses for the four billion people on the planet who earn less than four dollars a day. Uh, the lessons that we've learned, and then I'll tell you how we kind of learn them, are if you're going to have successful delivery at the base of the pyramid, you have to have products that consumers want. And the second is that if you're going to scale that intervention, you're going to have to have some kind of sustainable model that can work on an economic basis. I learned both of those lessons even 
early on in my career as a student, and I'll tell you a story of some work that I did that I think typifies th those lessons. I was working in Colombia in the western state of Choco, and it's the poorest state in Colombia, and we set up a temporary clinic to take care of folks, and we got there and we saw a huge number of Choco Indians who had canoed down the river for a day and a half to come and get their eyes to check. They heard that a team of American eye doctors were going to be there. And in the throes of that work, I met a 40-year-old Choco Indian woman who was known as the blind lady. And she had canoed down the river a day and a half with uh, her family to see the doctors. And sure enough, she had profound nearsightedness. She wasn't blind because of a medical condition, but just because she needed a strong pair of glasses. And we had a pair of glasses that matched her prescription. And we were all very proud of ourselves because we turned this blind lady into a sighted lady. And we went about our work. And two days later, she returned at the clinic. And she said when she got back to the village, her family and her friends and everyone laughed at her because her glasses looked so funny. And the glasses that we had given her were these 1950 cat eye glasses because they were donated and that was the only one that matched her prescription. And she said, I want something that people won't laugh at. And it was a reasonable request. And we said, well, we're sorry because of your unique prescription. This is the only one that matches what you need. And then she did something that was remarkable to all of us and I'll never forget it. She took the glasses off, she put them on the table, she went into her canoe and she went back up river. And she would prefer to be blind than to be laughed at and ridiculed. And it was that moment I realized that you have to have a consumer first approach and you have to take into consumer's preference if you're going to have any chance of getting your product to be, get uptaken. Uh, so that was one lesson. The other lesson that I learned was that our model was basically taking glasses, taking a team of doctors, pl plopping ourselves down for a week, and then the next year going someplace else. And we weren't building anything that was sustainable or economically viable. We were using a very charity-based model, which was good because we helped a lot of people, but there's no way that it was going to scale. So in taking some of those lessons forward with Vision Spring, we've been working really hard over the last decade to identify economically viable business models that can scale through the marketplace to deliver products and services that people value and want and aspire to. So we uh, try to design our products so that they match the cultural preferences of our consumers. Uh, and we try to create distribution strategies that are viable within the marketplaces in which we work. Which sounds relatively easy, but uh, as we all find out when we try to do that, it's very hard. And we have, we are probably on our sixth or seventh iteration of testing models that work. Um, and because we have a pretty high bar, we have thrown out some models that maybe a lot of other organizations uh, would have stayed at if they had, uh, as, as nonprofit organizations. So for instance, we started with our first model that sort of launched us as an organization was we would train local women to start small businesses selling eyeglasses to their neighbors. And we'd give them a little backpack, and it was a business in a bag, we called it. And we created this army of what we call vision entrepreneurs, and they would go into their community and screen people for needing glasses. And it was an elegant approach, and it worked in many ways in that the women were making some extra money. They were giving access to glasses to people who didn't have them before. But no matter how hard we, we worked at it, uh, we couldn't make it sustainable or commercially viable. We, they couldn't sell enough glasses to cover the operating expenses of the organization because the margin structure was low. Uh, and there were a number of va variables that made the business not work. One was that the margins were low. Two was that our consumers, the people who we were selling to, the demand for our product was latent. It wasn't like they were looking for glasses. They didn't even know they had vision problems. So it was expensive to wake up the demand and create the demand. The people who we were targeting were living in rural communities, so the, uh, the cost of, uh, of getting to our customer, even just physically getting to them, was high. Um, so the population was distributed. So there were all these f forces that any sane business person would say, uh-uh, I'm not going there. Low margins, low customer uptake, um, uh, uh, people who are scattered about, so high cost of, uh, of reaching your consumer. 
all the dynam business dynamics weren't there. So we've been iterating, and I can tell you more about some of the iterations as, the, uh, as it goes on, but we've morphed that model into two broad models. One is what we call our hub and spoke model, and the other is what we call our partnership model. So first, our partnership model, about two-thirds of our glasses are delivered that way. We, t we took into account the things that didn't work with our first model, and we said, well, why can't we train other organizations that already have the distribution platform, which was really the expensive part. About 80% of our cost of getting glasses is not the cost of goods, it's the distribution cost. Why couldn't we find other organizations <coughs> that have already built up networks of, distribu of distribution and add our product into their basket of goods? So that partnership channel is typified by our work with BRAC, which is, as many of you know, an organization in Bangladesh that has a huge distribution reach through their community health workers. These are women who already sell products, health products and other products, and we've trained them to add eyeglasses into their basket of goods. And that reduces our cost of distribution greatly, and we are working now with BRAC to go from 20 districts to all 60 districts or 65 districts in Bangladesh, and we'll be scaling throughout Bangladesh over the next five years so that within five years we'll help 1.7 million people get glasses uh, through that network. So that's a classic example of our partnership channel. We work with partners in about 20 countries to, to, to distribute glasses. On the other side, our hub and spoke model is a model in which we as an organization manage ourselves. Um, it's uh, a hub is a retail, fixed retail location, and the spokes are the women who fan out into the community. We call it sort of lens crafters meets Mary Kay. And so the retail is where we sell glasses and we sell glasses on sort of a cross-subsidized basis where we give people the ability to choose economically where they can afford. So we have very low cost glasses for what we call our prisoners of price consumers. And then we have a little higher cost products for what we call our savvy shoppers, people who can spend a little bit more and that higher margin enables us to cross-subsidize the, the prisoners of price customers. And then the vision entrepreneurs go out and fan into the communities to get to, into the uh, deeper areas where distribution doesn't exist, sell simple products, and then people who need more advanced care get sent to the hub. But I can tell you guys more about that, but that's just a quick introduction of uh, some of our work. Wonderful. Thanks, Jordan. Last but not least. Yes. So, um, we're proximity and we work in um, Myanmar, which is really actually a tough operating environment to work in. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, poorer than Nigeria, and um, it's really bottom of the bottom billion. And what it means is that, um, well, we target um, customers who are rural families living on one to two dollars a day typically, and they're very remote. Um, they drive ox carts and might get into town maybe twice a, a year. Um, they don't have cell phones or phones in the villages. It's uh, maybe one to two percent um, cell phone penetration. No internet, um, no electricity. Ninety-five percent of rural Myanmar is, uh, has no electricity and it's not coming anytime soon. Um, and so we have about, you know, it's an agrarian economy, 40 million people living like this. Um, and um, so the backbone of, of the country is uh, small plot farmers. And so this is our, basically our customer base. And we design and create and deliver or market um, products that will significantly boost their productivity, daily productivity and incomes. So that's the lens that we use in designing products. And we have an um, in-country lab and a product design team. And we also partner with Stanford D School as well as um, professional design firms. Um, so we, there's a lot of, we use the same Western, you know, or, or high-end design <laughs> uh, methodologies that are used to design um, products for the top 10% of the world, to except that we design for the bottom billion. Um, so I think the we started uh, nine or 10 years ago, 2004, and it's great to have a product, but then we discovered, so we started with um, a base of um, 185 agro-dealer shops um, in towns across Myanmar, um, in about 110 towns. But we soon realized that um, 
you know, farmers get to town maybe twice a year or so. These products weren't really um, conveniently accessible in villages. So um, what we also, what we ended up doing was um, we had these evangelists. They were product users um, whose lives were dramatically changed. Their incomes doubled, tripled from using our products, um, going from eight hours of drudgery a day to two hours on a Stairmaster, for example. Um, and so they were great evangelists, and um, there was, you know, they were, it's all word of mouth um, advertising, and so they were really um, talking to their neighbors and, and neighboring villages. So they, um, we decided to use them as our networks for, sort of like Avon ladies. Um, and um, we now have a network of 850 independent village agents, and out of the, and something we've developed um, from them is um, uh, we have about 89 of them now who ac actually operate independent um, uh, little village kiosks is what we call it, an agent kiosk. And each agent will serve about five to ten villages. Um, and so that kiosk carries all of our products. So our product line, I, I forgot to say, is um, irrigation. Um, foot-operated irrigation pumps, and also water storage tanks, and drip irrigation, gravity-fed, um, all designed for the small plot farmer. They're all under $50. And then we have three solar lanterns uh, models under $30. Um, we have financial services designed um, for farmers, and also farm advisory services. So, so we have this network of 850 village agents, and starting up more of the village kiosk, an actual shop um, at the village level. Um, and then we also have um, about 1,800 village uh, committees. We got quite involved in um, Cyclone Nargis. Uh, we had a cyclone, devastating cyclone um, in 2008, um, and that um, killed 200,000 people in the Delta. So. We were very involved in that, and um, and also very involved in a severe drought in the main part of the country. So out of those, out of that work, um, we ended up with a whole base or network of 1,800 village groups who had a lot of trust and and um, a relationship with us. And so they are now uh, a great part of our delivery platform in terms of delivering solar lights and. Um, collecting all the payments and stuff, um, things for us, so I can go into more detail. But, but basically, we've ended up, our biggest achievement and in innovation is that we've ended up today with a proprietary um, distribution platform that is solely ours and that we can run a lot of other products and services through. Um, and that we're finding that a lot of people find, you know, don't have this and that it's extremely valuable. Uh, and it reaches um, over 10,000 villages. Each of you talked to some degree about the importance of partnerships as a way of getting to scale. Um, if, there was, if there's one thing that you know now that you wish you'd known when you started out in terms of trying to build partnerships, a, a lesson, something that went wrong that you think would be helpful for others, um, what, would that, what would that thing be? As, uh, as you think about the way that you've, you built your networks, you built partnerships with other organizations. I think the lessons that we've learned in, in 30 years is that uh, partners are super important, but good partners are, are, are even more important. Um, I think the, the, the examples where we have succeeded um, very well uh, are, have been the ones where our partners have been uh, consistent in value and, and, uh, and the mission and objectives. Uh, but also they had capacity and capability and the willingness to, to gain that capacity and capability. Uh -huh. um, and, and the ones where we have not succeeded as, as, as well is where there was a mismatch in our objectives and theirs and, uh, and their ability to really learn and, and adopt and, and, uh, and, and kind of become um, uh, full partners. Uh, because oftentimes when we are developing solutions, um, our goal is to make sure that we bring our partners up to speed and then leave them with them. And a lot of times these partners are local and, and they need to be local because we are, these solutions are local. Even uh -huh. though we are dealing with global health, 
every solution is local in its, in its uh, nature at the end. Um, so we need to make sure that it's sustainable, we need to make sure that there's, there's viability um, from you know, ecosystem and, and market forces point of view. Um, so that's, that's really uh, a key uh, lesson that we've learned and uh, in many cases where we have not, not succeeded as well. We wish we knew what our partners' capabilities were and what their value systems were. So that's that's really the key. I would echo that, except that our partners are at the village level. So mm -hmm. we have a you know it's a many levels down, and it is a relationship of trust. Um, it is important that you know eighty percent of our village in, independent village agents actually are our product users. So they they know our products and. We also train them and bring them into Yangon, capital city, and they've never been to the capital before in their whole life. So it's like a trip to Hawaii or something. <laughs> um, but it's um, so that relationship of trust is really important, and and we monitor and um, communicate pretty closely and keep in touch, um, and also call them. Our, we call the dealers. We call the annually just to make sure that we have that quality control. I would just add that. Um, with our two distribution channels, the hub and spoke and the partnership, the difference is a hub and spoke strategy is like having a direct sales force. And when you have a direct sales force, it's a wonderful thing in many ways because if you want to push a certain product, you just say, okay, everybody go in that direction. And you have, if you will, control over what your team does because they're working for you. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a, strategy that you can control much more easily. However, it's much more expensive to scale it. So that's the downside of having your own distribution channel and that's where partnerships come in handy. It becomes less expensive to scale. But on the flip side, partnerships are difficult because you don't have control. And what you find, it's like having in sales parlance a multi-line sales force. So it's a sales force that sells multiple things. And unless your product has good margins and fast turn uh, and is, is easy to sell, it's gonna fall down to the bottom of the bag and next thing you know, people aren't gonna be buying your products because the agents aren't showing it because it's harder to sell and maybe has lower mar margins. So it becomes in, in, imperative for us to make our products easy to sell, high margins, and um, sometimes you know, our product doesn't have as fast a turn as others, so we can't control that by just the nature of that product. Uh, so the goal is when you work with partners to try to get your product as high up on the bag as you can by, you know, controlling those forces. So the lessons that we've learned with, with partners is that you gotta make it easy, otherwise your product is gonna end up falling to the bottom of the bag because they have a lot of competing interests and they're not laser focused like we are on vision services. They've got 10 other options and unless you can make vision services easy and profitable, you're not gonna have good partners. So that's, um, so aligning our interests with our partners' interests are, are key for making partnerships work. Otherwise, you just spin a lot of wheels and you don't get anywhere. I would agree with the last comment you made about making it viable for them, making, making it easy for, for partners, uh, especially on the delivery side, because if it's not, they, they're not, so it'll fall to the bottom of the bag, it would, all it would get out of the bag altogether. Right. <laughs> they would just give it up. Exactly. They, they wouldn't carry it. Yeah. I think, but from our, my, our perspective, I think we're coming at it from a slightly different angle. I mean, uh, we're a very old company and an inventor company, so we kind of tend to think we can do it ourselves. Um, and it's a, it's a big learning to actually um, reach out to partners in a field that we, uh, we're not familiar in. Um, and that's not even in the delivery end of the scale, but also even in the in the product development, um, you know, as if, I, if you see the way I described uh, our initiative, we're coming from what we know, installation, polycarbonate, and believing that these solutions will deliver benefits to uh, customers. And as Jordan said, it's really important to, to actually test that, that they really like our solutions and it's actually helpful to their needs. Um, it's good in theory, <coughs> but we still need to have proof packages. So in terms of the learnings that I would, I would say, I think a more structured approach to, approach to partners would, would, be, would be some a learning from, uh, from my experience thus far. Because it tends to be a bit haphazard. I meet somebody at cocktails and I go like, oh, that sounds really great. And I call them and then we have a discussion. We have, you know, <coughs> Mullins or, or, or other um, uh, consultancies helping us introduce us. 
uh, and that's also extremely helpful to weed out reputable ones and, and not. But because it's a space we're not familiar with, I can uh, there's no reference point. It's hard to tell who is good in what, the reputation <coughs> behind it. So I think for us, it'd be a lot more um, efficient if we had a much, uh, much more structured and rigorous way of managing partners internally. Okay, I'd like to open things up a little bit to any questions or observations or comments um, from all of you. Hi, um, my name is Sherry Han and I'm a student here at, can you hear me? I'm a student here at Oxford and I'm doing um, research on small scale farming in East Africa. Um, and one of the things that I did research on was extension services and so there you had farmers who had free access to products, um, free extension devices and services in terms of, yeah. of farming techniques and what have you. And the issue was actually marketing their products to the outside world and exporting them because of transportation costs. And I was wondering if any of you came across a situation where um, in, in, in delivering products to the farmers, you've actually also made it easier for farmers to export their products to either the city and the r and urban areas and also to other markets in, in, in Europe or the States or We haven't quite gotten there yet. Well, we have um, proximity finance um, kind of unit, which, is, um, which does crop loans for farmers. And we're now prototyping and, and um, working with uh, developing a new product, which is um, basically larger loans um, that are, farmers can buy a, tr a, um, a transport vehicle together. Um, so those are, or, or tiller or power tillers. Um, so equipment or transport vehicles. So that's one thing um, we'll be working with. We don't work with farmers that are in global health, but we do have situations where our global health products that are, we develop with our partners that, that are being manufactured by our partners oftentimes they find uh, application or markets in other countries. Um, and, uh, and we've helped them build that capacity to, to access markets in other parts of the world. So for example, we, one of our uh, key partners, uh, vaccine manufacturer in, uh, in India, has been able to supply that particular vaccine to most of Africa at, at a very low price. So um, I think that example of, you're referring to innovations or, or ideas or, or products that are being uh, developed or, or manufactured in a particular country or particular region and making it, it out of there. Is, is that, was that your, that was your question, right? So yeah, so that's an example of that. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Peacock. I've uh, recently set up a franchising company in uh, Kenya and we're franchising qualified vets and livestock technicians to deliver high quality livestock uh, inputs and other crop inputs as well to farmers and pastoralists across uh, Kenya. We've uh, had a huge issue, I think, with our suppliers. Um, and I think this is very, very common in these kinds of uh, emerging, um, you know, BOP kind of markets, where you've got a very small number of importers and suppliers trying to um, sell to um, a vast number of uh, very small, um, usually typically run family kind of input supply um, uh, rural businesses. And what I've been absolutely stunned uh, by is uh, how quickly you can uh, move margins very, very significantly through consolidating um, orders. So we buy on behalf of all our franchises. We've now got 35 franchises after one year. That number will double uh, this year. We already reach 60,000 farmers and we're already the biggest input, uh, livestock input uh, buyer in the market in Kenya and that's after one year, which doesn't say anything about us, it just says how fragmented the market <coughs> is in, in the Kenyan setting. Um, but we've recently found, just by the simple expedient of importing directly from manufacturers, that we can move margins from 12% to over 100%. So something is really fundamentally wrong uh, from a supplier's viewpoint. And I really get annoyed when you hear kind of big companies talking about BOP markets because they really haven't got a clue how to get products down to the grassroots, how to structure prices that really incentivize products to move down the chain into remote places. Um, and what you see is that importers and the key distributors are creaming off 80, 90% of the margin and the poor guy at the grassroots who are you know, facing directly the farmer are just getting the thinnest, thinnest margins. And it's just fundamentally wrong. 
I think the only way that you can change that whole power dynamic in the supply chain is to shorten it completely, but from the viewpoint of the grassroots, not, not trying to reach down, but to reach up and actually improve the efficiency from the grassroots back up the supply chain. Uh, we are now starting to look at contract manufacturing of our own branded products um, in India um, because farmers are actually asking for um, Sidai branded products in the market um, and they're very eager for the quality uh, that we can uh, be, uh, have, have assured because uh, counterfeit products are rampant in the market and regulation is, is almost non-existent. So I think, you know, for me, it is all about structuring these kind of rural input supply chains in as efficient a manner as possible, with the value getting down as much as possible to the grassroots, so that you're not just selling stuff. You know, we d are not a drug-pushing company. We are a livestock services company. We aim to offer services on farm. The only way that's going to happen effectively is if those small businesses are very profitable at the grassroots. And at the moment, None of them are. They're all working on, on absurdly thin margins, uh, even in high, relatively high turnover businesses. Gentleman back. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ron Bohm, and I'm a co-founder of a, a startup <coughs> in India. Um, and I'm going to comment on a couple of examples. The last one, for example, there, I don't think there's one model. We have a um, prosperity creation company. That's our our mission. But we're trying to decide whether we're an education company that does distribution or a distribution company that does education, because there's a lot more that happens down at the, at, the, at the base. But we have a blend of, you know, what Debbie has and what this gentleman just has. The point is that it's very, it varies quite a bit. At the, at the bottom, our, our franchisees, you've got about, <coughs> oh, um, 150, 200 now. We're scaling up to about 500. Our villages are 5,000 to, to you know, 20,000 people, and I think Debbie's are probably smaller. <laughs> Our farmers live in the villages, so they're there every day as opposed to once or twice a, a year. Um, it, it varies quite a bit. And so it'd be great to have this as a continued discussion of what the last mile is, but the last mile is very different no matter where you are with, with the population density, the habits of where people live. Uh, this, the uh, distribution that's already set up there to get stuff, ag inputs, for example, into the hands of farmers, uh, the channel up, as was mentioned here, they vary a great deal. And it would be great if we could keep this as a topic going and have case studies to show you know, people. We, des we developed ourselves for companies like, the big companies like Bayer, and then the Delights, because getting to the last mile is very, very difficult. We just decided to make our business sustainable and then figure out how we could make it all work. And it's been like drinking from a fire hose. We learn and revise and change. All of our assumptions we started with are changed. Um, but we keep moving towards a sustainable model, which is what we started with, and we keep tweaking until it gets there. I am Catherine Dolan. I'm on the faculty here at the uh, Said School. And thanks for your presentations. They were all very interesting and uh, informative. Um, I just wanted to follow up with um, Debbie and Jordan about the agent model that you were uh, speaking to. We've done some research with Avon and with Jita in Bangladesh and looking at these entrepreneurs in terms of you know whether or not this is an empowering opportunity for them. And so I'm trying to get a sense of how they're compensated for the delivery of, of your various goods and also what your rate of turnover is um, at the agent level. Thank you. For our irrigation products, a good agent might net about two to three hundred dollars a season, um, um, a growing season d during the dry season, like six months. Are they on commission, or is there yeah. So, like for for every um, pump that's sold, they'll make a dollar or two, and for solar lanterns, also the D lights, um, they'll also um, uh, make a dollar or two. So. It's, and the D-lights are really taking off in terms of volume. I, we've just uh, launched them only 10 months ago, and we've already sold 20,000 units. So. Our agents um, are different in each of the two models. In our hub-and-spoke model, uh, they have a base uh, salary now and with a commission on top of that. In, historically, all of our agents were just commission agents, uh, but now with our hub-and-spoke model, where we have these fixed stores, 
all of our agents have a low base salary and commission. And uh, what we found uh, last year in El Salvador, as an instance, because they have a big upside if they push a lot of product uh, successfully on, and get glasses into the hands of people, uh, about 50% of our agents actually ended up making more money than our optometrists in our store. Um, so that was uh, a surprise for us and uh, made for some happy, what we call vision entrepreneurs, that's the name of our agents. Um, in the partnership model, um, it's on commission. And each organization chooses its commission structure. And because our product is only one product in a large basket of products, it isn't um, necessary for them to make a full livelihood on that product. It just ends up enhancing a livelihood. And so some, some of the agents will sell only one or two or three glasses a month. Others will sell 50 or 60 a month. And so it just depends on, uh, on, on that. And so it's quite, quite across the board in terms of how much money they make uh, in the partnership. The tur in the turnover, well, that was one of the reasons we initially we got rid of our initial agent-only model, where they were um, working independently on selling just this one product. And that was another lesson we learned, that it's hard to make a living selling one product. Uh, the typical agent or vision entrepreneur would start with zero sales and for the first six months you'd see the sales go up to around 20 or 25 pair of glasses uh, and it would then plateau and then for about 70 percent of them 80 percent of them it would start to trail off and a few about the rest would kind of keep flat and uh, so it was about a 70 percent turnover after within 18 months and so the cost of retraining and getting people going, it just wasn't uh, viable. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons why that, that strategy in and of itself, just having agents selling one product, uh, what didn't, didn't end up working. And for us, it worked because um, our agents were farmers. And so they had you know, the, that base to work from. And they also used their wives and their daughters and, you know, to, to sell the D-lights or sell other things. So it, it wasn't like a full-time job, although those who are really, um, you know, good at it, they, um, they end up, you know, the farms are taken care of by their wives or, and their family, and then they, they work full-time on installing drip irrigation and things like that. Justin uh, My name is Jeremy Alberg. I work for Global Viral. We are trying to understand how uh, pathogens move from animals into humans, particularly in Central Africa. And one of the things that we're trying to do right now is to eradicate the, um, the consumption of bushmeat, um, which is, you know, is, a, is a, a huge issue for um, infectious disease. So one of our ideas is to create sustainable markets for um, the consumption of, of wild game. Uh, and we are, one of, our, you know, one of our projects that we're working on right now in both uh, urban and rural areas is to try to create these sustainable markets. Um, and before, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about market research. Um, so I'm interested uh, in take up whether, you know, we have this great idea, we think that it's going to eradicate poverty and, and decrease the risk of infectious disease and, all, and, and it'd be a win-win for conservation, etc. We think it's a great idea, but before we do that, um, I think it's important to go in and do your market research. So I'm interested, for example, how do we know, how did you know that the D-lights were going to sell? How, um, Jordan, great, great, uh, example about uh, this you know blind woman who how do you know what styles they're going to want and it probably will change potentially village to village if not country to country so i wonder if the panel could speak a little bit more about market research before you go in actually before delight started they they started with us as grad students in myanmar so um we we did a lot of need finding and and prototyping really very early stage with them um and then um we just looked at the options in the villages and what the people were using all over the country. Um, and it's candlelight or kerosene or diesel lamps. Um, and, and for us, the lens we use is the economic, I mean, what kind of value proposition we're creating. And it's pretty dramatic if, if they're using um, candlelights, you know, they're saving $6 a month just by switching to D-light. Um, and the fire hazard is huge in, in a village with thatch huts um, um, 
and that sheds are breezy and I mean so you know every vill every household has a, is in a thatch hut so we knew the demand was going to be pretty big you know, all over the country and rolling it out to um, one thing we saw we rolled it out you know slowly so we could you know just estimate demand and what we saw was say there's a village of um, 35 households well we would um, demonstrate the delight and everyone would you know, we'd say, who can buy it now or who wants to buy it now, cash down. So four hands would go up, four households want to buy it right then. And then we'd say, well, what if we offered 100-day um, financing? How many households want it? 34 households want it, you know, so uh, um, 31 households want it. So it was all a matter of making it um, accessible through installment. Um, an installment plan. In, in our case, um, because we're resource constrained, we try to just take shortcuts as much as possible. So if we go into a marketplace, like for instance our story in India, <coughs> we go into a marketplace and you look in the villages and you look in the towns and you say, are people wearing metal frames or plastic frames? Are people wearing gold frames or black frames? And you get a sense of sort of what's culturally appropriate and you start bring in products and start trying them. And then you find after three months that your metal frames are outselling your plastic frames three to one, your gold frames are outselling your black frames two to one, and you start to put more inventory in there. And, uh, and then you find, like in our case with India, with our reading glasses, uh, most reading glasses have the whole lens is a, a strength, and so if you look through them in the distance, everything will look blurry. And we would often get people returning our glasses saying, well, when I look in the distance, it's blurry. Well, we said, well, we explained to you, it's not for, you know, you have to take them off to look in the distance and use them just for reading. And we'd explain it to them and they just didn't get that concept. So we said, okay, well, let's make a pair of glasses that have, has clear vision, clear glass on top and with the little D section bifocal. And suddenly people could walk around and, uh, and they liked that because they could walk and they could now read down here and walk around with the glasses. And they suddenly those outsold the single visions like five to one, and it became a much more popular product. And then they started to say, you know what, because I'm wearing these glasses all the time and I look smart and stuff and I go outside, it would be great if these became sunglasses. And so they, they said, so you're asking us for transition bifocals? And we said, <laughs> okay, so uh, we can do that. Um, but, um, you know, your reading glasses cost two or three dollars. How much would you pay for transition bifocals? Well, the good news is they pay more, but the bad news was they pay one dollar more. <laughs> and so we spent 18 months, we found a manufacturer in Taiwan who was able to make transition bifocal glasses, and we entered into the market, and they became quite popular in India, and actually now they're popular in Latin America as well. And so product innovation is all about interfacing with your consumer, seeing what's selling, being aware of that, and taking that, uh, that knowledge and feedback back to the manufacturer's floor, talking to your manufacturer and seeing if it's possible. And sometimes it's, it's not possible and other times it's possible with a lot of pain and sometimes it's possible without too much pain. So that's sort of an example of, of how we've gone about it. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that. Market research is an iterative process. So when you usually go into a market, you need to understand the needs, market needs. So you really need to embed yourself <coughs> and understand initial starting point. But once you've, once you've gotten into market and you're uh, starting to interact with it through sales, uh, you start to get more data, and then you got to have a whole product, product cadence so that you have multi-generational product planning. I mean, you got additional products that you're bringing into the market. You got to be responsive to the market, and and, and these markets evolve as well um, quite a bit. So um, that needs to be kept in mind. So it's it's not a frozen in time thing. Market research isn't. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we do. Uh, <coughs> you know. A uh, 50 page report on uh, a survey on uh, the market um, at all. I mean, I think, I think the most important thing is we have every single staff person having 100 conversations with, with uh, dollar day customers and have a lot of insights and um, so that we can draw on it all the time when we're trying to figure out um, how to tweak things. Gopi Gopalakrishnan from Baldil Partners. It's probably rewarding to also look at this delivery aspect from the other end of the telescope because there are viable businesses which already exist. Yeah. 
villages across that. So are there any broad principles emerging? And I think there are a couple which are fairly evident. One, if you, if you go to any village um, of India, Africa, you, you will not find specialist shops. Every, uh, a shop which is selling confectionery is also selling notebooks, is also selling vegetables. So a crucial aspect for uh, forming markets at that level is to also focus on the range of products and services you'll have to deliver, what, uh, Jordan, what you, what you were saying earlier. The second aspect is that you also don't see um, too much of home delivery, for instance, which is fairly common in urban areas where there are larger agglomerations of population. It's the whole approach here seems to be to get as viably close to the community as possible, but without really getting too close, so that you are at a distance, so that you can attract the patient. So what is that distance? How do you make that intuitive calculation about it? And I think the third one is also to understand the, the, the role of credit. Often we tend to ignore that because when, when it comes to five cents and 10 cents kind of value, we think credit doesn't have a role. But at that level, that seems to have an enormous role because the family is accumulating credit and probably settling it once a month or so, or when the harvest is done. Um, that aspect, we don't have much, much kind of insights into it, but that gets to be very, very crucial. And how do you tackle that part, especially if you want to have a fairly centralized operation getting decentralized? Uh, we don't, do we want to get into that credit aspect so that we can facilitate some, some transactions between a retail outlet at that level to the consumer? So just just brief point about the market research. Um, there are two things, two insights which have been available to us. And it just kind of get, it takes my mind back to what uh, Henry Ford said, um, that if I wanted to, if I wanted to use market research, I would have tried to find out about a faster running horse. Because when there are disruptive, when he was trying to put together his car and its various aspects, there are disruptive technologies where the population is not even able to relate to what you're saying. Like the way we tried, when we tried to use some um, technologies, very difficult for them to explain so that they can react to it. And second, at least in South Asia, our experience has been the, the findings can be also pretty deceptive, especially when it comes to pricing. Um, they will indicate certain acceptable levels and you try to develop a package and a market on that basis. And when you try to market it, it doesn't work that way. Because when they have to put the money down, the, the, the behavior is completely different. So I, I take your, your kind of approach to it. Go ahead and do it in a certain way and keep going back to the factory and, uh, and modifying it and refining it instead of trying to get your market research to provide all the answers. It, it doesn't seem to work very well. Mm. Thank you. Can I speak of the role of credit? Yes. In fact, your venture was one of the examples I had in here as, <laughs> a, as in terms of uh, delivery uh, innovative delivery mechanisms. But we, we actually implement, deployed uh, a safe order technology in, in Cambodia. <coughs> in Cambodia, And we, we used three different mechanisms to deliver it. One through retail channels, and two uh, through direct sales. One was direct sales door to door, and one was through uh, an M MFI, microfinance organization, that worked with local entrepreneurs, which were, which were making these filters. Um, and what we found was uh, very interesting. Even though the, the households that were buying these products had the paying capacity, and they, they had indicated that they had the paying capacity, the door-to-door -door sales did not work as well as the one which was enabled by microfinance organization. So microfinance in this case, the credit in this case, had play, played the role of a catalyst. Um, it was not that they couldn't pay that money, but it, it, al it allowed a family to actually um, feel comfortable with making, buying this particular product uh, on credit and then paying it off over a period of time. So it, it was, it was uh, um, kind of a great learning for us and now we are actually um, uh, deploying the same sort of approach in, in parts of Africa and we are actually uh, uh, deploying um, our, our latrines, to, uh, you know, well, new, newly designed latrines in Cambodia with, with that model and that seems to be working reasonably well as well. So I, th I think credit in some markets, credit may play the role of actually even when the customers can't afford it and they, they need, need that, without that they cannot buy the product. But in other markets, it may just play the role of a capitalist. Are there any other questions? Uh, this gentleman here. John Elkington and Selena has already declared an interest which I otherwise would have done, which is that we uh, are beginning to work with buyer. And the question that I wanted to ask is sparked by two points that were made by here. One was, 
almost, if I over-dramatize what I think I heard you say, you know, big multinational corporations should not be trying to push down towards the uh, base of the pyramid. And then behind, we need multiple models. And, and it's in that context, I just wanted to pose a, a, a question to uh, Selena, but perhaps to the panelists in general. And that is, we're talking about some of the things that get in the way of some of the solutions getting uh -huh. to the right people in, in the right sort of format. There are cultural barriers. Selina, you're Asian. You work for a German company. Your CEO is British. Do you see sort of cultural uh, differences? Uh, I'm sorry, we haven't prepared this. But, but it, 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 in terms of the grasp of the different folk in, uh, of the base of the pyramid challenge or opportunity space. I think for sure. Maybe I could talk a little bit about how the Sunrise Project came about. Um, when I first started working in it uh, about a year, year ago, um, I didn't realize I was working in the Sunrise Project because it was actually a secret project in, in the company. And it's a curious uh, reason for it because it's not our normal traditional business model nor is it CSR, and we, we don't want it to be CSR. It's actually uh, meant to be a, a sincere uh, alignment of business interests and social interests. But within the, the context of the company, if you talk to people about it, they're very excited and they're very engaged and feel very um, committed to this uh, initiative. But it's, it takes a long time to get the mindset aligned uh, to um, think about the bottom pyramid uh, in the way we would like. So I, 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 it's, it's a big learning process for us. Um, and it's an area, as I mentioned, that we are not uh, familiar with, but we're trying to learn as much as we can as we, as we go along. So th apart from the cultural differences in the markets we're trying to aim at and the partners, I mean, even with corporates and the development world, there is a gap. I, I, I mean, for me, school this is my first time at school, and it's been an eye-opener um, of what issues are being dealt with and the solutions that are on offer. Um, and a whole bunch of frogs to kiss. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's so, for me, it's, it's, a, it's it's a very good learning experience as to what issues people are facing. And, but that's one of the big cultural gaps. Even within the company, um, there is also a, a, a number of you know, sort of bridges we have to still cross, I guess. Is that what you mean, John? I don't know. Does that answer your question? Not directly. <laughs> in, in the sense that there must be different cultural takes on all of this. And any company is diverse, and those diversities can be a strength at times, and they can be a weakness if people just don't understand what you're trying to do. I, it's, I'll leave the question on the table. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to take a bash at it. <laughs> you, you guys are completely holistic <laughs> in your <laughs> cultures. <laughs> I'd be interested to, um, the, the question from the back about, about the differences between markets. I mean, you're active in very different markets, Jordan, and um, I'd be interested to hear your sort of, your reflections on the, the, the differences in the delivery challenge in you know, South Africa versus, um, this is Peru. Each market is certainly different, and each one comes with its own unique set of challenges. Uh, blending that in with culture is a little bit different, but in terms of the culture of our customers, uh, for example, um, in India, culturally, it's more difficult to get people to wear glasses. 70% uh, of women of marriageable age in India feel that if they wear glasses, they're, they're less marriable. That kind of cultural bias against glasses doesn't exist, for instance, in El Salvador. So it makes uh, our marketing and selling of glasses easier. And so we have to change our marketing approach and our general approach when we come across those kind of cultural differences. So that's just one kind of difference. Uh, also, differences in in, again, comparing India to El Salvador, in India, the average person who we're um, reaching uh, is making 40 or $50 a month, whereas in El Salvador, a poor person is making 100 to $150 a month. So it <coughs> enables us to have a margin structure that is a lot easier to uh, make profitable. Um, the good news is that in India there's a lot more people. So if we can uh, be successful even at a low margin, uh, we have the potential of becoming profitable because just the volume uh, opportunities. Um, so, so those are just, uh, does that touch on yep. some of the things that you wanted to talk about? Yeah. Did you want to come? 
Well, no, I, I think I, I agree. Yeah. Every market that we, we work in, we have, to, we have 20, we're in 22 countries, and um, we work with partners in all of these countries, and we find the cultural differences uh, and the market preferences are way, way different. So, yeah, so I, think, I think what we try to do is when we're working on our products, when you're designing our products, when you're designing our solutions, we, are lo we look at it from architecture point of view. So there are some, some broad principles that we apply and the products generally meet certain um, principles in terms of design. Um, they meet uh, the, the, the need on the ground um, uh, on a broad level across the world, but then when we are implementing it in individual, in individual countries, we are quite aware of the variations that exist and uh, a, a different iteration of each of these products is what we, what we end up implementing. The reason we, we approach that from architecture point of view is because I, I think um, when you have uh, lots and lots of different kinds of designs, lots of different ways of approaching a problem uh, without really taking into account what's optimal, you end up losing uh, the best of what's available across the world. So we try to learn from all the all the uh, different markets that we work in and bring in bring in at least the uh, the key pieces that need to be there in a product. I think we should take a few more questions though, if there are some. So um. I, I clearly didn't express myself very clearly. I spent my life trying to get big pharmaceutical, veterinary pharmaceutical companies involved in Africa and interested because they're not interested at all, and they're not interested because the market is is not quantified for them at all. They haven't got a clue. It's so underestimated, uh, the potential market in Africa. Um, but I'm interested because they produce quality products. And I, I think you know this is such an under-recognized um, issue in agricultural inputs, the poor quality that farmers have to put up with. Not only can they not get access, but even if they can get access, they've got vaccines that don't work, they've got antibiotics that don't work, They've got seeds that don't germinate. They've got fertilizers that are full of rubbish. And this is just a huge problem, very under-recognized in my belief. But I think the bigger issue is maybe there's a cultural problem, but I think that the biggest issue is the size, uh, the size of a big multinational versus the size of a varied uh, masses of small fragmented, small rural distributors. And what, in my view, and that's what I'm trying to build in Kenya anyway, is a kind of medium-sized, efficient, uh, you know, rural-based distribution network that a big company can relate to directly, mm -hmm. you know, without a lot of, frankly, lazy people who just import, warehouse, move from point A to point B and add absolutely no value except from moving point A to point B and no, adding no value at all in terms of the use of the product training people how to use things properly because uh, you know most agricultural inputs are uh, used so inefficiently uh, certainly in my field in livestock you know you've got people with no diagnostic skills at all you've got crooks quacks selling stuff that farmers just don't need and it's it's an it's an absolute mess it's a mess which is why you know I'm very very passionate about franchising because of the quality control uh, element to it um, and I personally think that's what, you know, farmers, <coughs> farmers certainly in Africa deserve. You know, I think financing is a huge issue um, that allows people to, to sort of um, be competitive in the market as a supplier and so that they can um, have the financing capital to, to um, take on more inventory and, um, and be a bigger supplier. Yeah, in fact, this, this particular point that you just made goes to the, one of the questions that you had asked us to think about, Andrew, when we were preparing for this panel. Uh, what are the bottlenecks? And, and I, actually, based on, uh, I, had, I was at Johnson Johnson um, before I got into global health. Um, and I, 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 that's something that, that that company faced as well. I mean, tier one markets are fine. But the moment you go to uh, bottom of the pyramid markets, there are so many layers that by the time the product reaches there, it's, it's, be, it's tagged on lots of cost and, and it just, it's not viable anymore. And it's the same problem with the pharmaceutical companies in Africa and uh, aside from the fact that they haven't sized the market appropriately. So having a, a small or medium sized distribution network that's efficient, that is widespread regionally, that's brilliant. If you're doing it, kudos to you and, and good luck to you. I think that's, that in my opinion is one of the three or four major barriers uh, facing, uh, you know, viability of these markets. Okay, maybe we could just take three last questions and then what I might do is ask each of the panelists to respond to one, two, or three of them 
or indeed to talk about something else. Let's make them good. Great. Um, so this is for the panelists, but really anyone in the audience as well that has uh, uh, input. Um, just curious, so we, we've heard a lot about bottlenecks that you're facing, some of the successes that you've had. If you could think of sort of ideal to be state in the future, mm -hmm. what would help get you there? What are the things that are missing? Just maybe a couple of takeaways for the rest of us, uh, what we should be working towards and what we're, we're missing mm -hmm. that we haven't talked about. That was an excellent last, <laughs> last three questions. It was fabulous, sorry. And the lady at the back. Thank you very much. My name is Eriko Ishikawa. I'm from the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And I just wanted to uh, specifically address uh, the issue brought up about local companies. We have been working with over 300 local companies that work with the base of the pyramid as economic agents. So either we're buying uh, from agribusinesses that are smallholder farmers, or we are actually working with uh, the, the, the buyers. We are doing some of the extension work that you're talking about and uh, the fertilizer. So trying to do this part of, a, uh, of the value chain so that a larger local company has more at stake and can actually provide financing, because I think that's the key. And on the distribution side, I've been doing this work, you know, working with value chains that really go all the way to, to the base of the pyramid for over 10 years. And there's so few companies that do distribution because distribution margins are actually quite low when you really look at it. Even though somebody's making money somewhere, it's usually at the ex importer level and not at the distribution. So we have a few cases though where distribution companies then morphed into distribution slash finance companies because in the financing you can actually make a little bit more money, so you kind of offset that. So um, I, I wanted to congratulate the whole panel. I mean, it's really fantastic to see this coming along and it's a lot of trial and error. And uh, I speak for the clients that I have, that I finance, that are doing this in, in the countries. Most of them are locally medium to larger companies, but they're not multinational, so they don't have that the, the deep pockets either, but they somehow have managed to, to, to reach uh, what we think is not that easy. So you see it from all the, the social enterprises and a lot of not-for-profits doing a very interesting job. You also see it from local companies and some multinationals that have been able to do something. But I, but I agree that it shouldn't be CSR. It should be really core business, because otherwise it will just fade when you know the next CEO comes along. But great panel, thank you so much. And then finally this gentleman here. Hi, my name's Stephen Harvey, I'm from Riders for Health. We um, mobilize community health workers uh, in Africa to reach the last mile with primary health care services. We also have a program in Nigeria where we're delivering pharmaceuticals as well to the last mile. But one of the other projects we do is about sample transport, and my question is kind of linked to the bottlenecks again. We, we recruit and uh, employ couriers who link com community health clinics with laboratories to transport samples and the results and the medication back to the community health. And that increases the turnaround, or it decreases the turnaround time, it increases the speed with which people can get their medication. We, that has increased demand at what we're calling the bottom of the pyramid, but the bottleneck now is at the laboratory. So have you got experience of where your service has created bottlenecks further up the chain where you, haven't, you don't operate and all you can do is influence, and how have you managed to influence that? I think that, that's a great point, actually, and I think, again, that, that work of increasing demand uh, through making it easier for customers, patients, uh, our families to actually access those those uh, services it is uh, it's it's really useful because uh, that's one of the biggest challenges in diagnostics, for example. Um, I, I think the the best way to address that, and, and we have encountered similar challenges where uh, when we there are bottlenecks everywhere. You el eliminate one bottleneck, the other one that didn't seem to be bottleneck becomes a bottleneck. It's a good problem to have in a way because you are systematically eliminating barriers. Uh, and, and oftentimes what we do, we try to do as much of risk assessment as possible as to how this market may evolve and what, may, what are the what if scenarios. Uh, and then we try to work with the partners um, to get them ready for something like that. So in South Africa, we are, for example, working on TB diagnostics and uh, they have these centralized 
uh, gene expert machines that actually do TB diagnosis, uh, TB and, uh, and hopefully HIV in the future. Um, but the samples have to come from, from uh, powerful lung places. And, uh, and, and there are a limited number of these machines placed uh, across the country. Um, so we, what we are working with them on are transport, transport, transport mechanisms for samples that could be mailed, for example. Um, so that, that, that will enable the, the transport issue. But then the, the, the centralized facilities must have ability to do more samples. Um, and, and so we're working on technologies to do that as well. So you, you gotta, you gotta address, you, you know your biggest challenge is demand creation, but once that's there, the next big challenge is gonna be capacity within these, uh, these facilities. But the distribution question that you asked and also uh, what uh, Alex uh, said, um, it makes it easy to tell a story. Um, we will not be distributing down that, ch that, that, um, that chain because we don't have the capabilities nor the, the people to do so. But we're looking for partners who can. And when the last trip I went to India in uh, January, we met a, a guy, a banker, who, went, who left banking and wanted to get into the agricultural sector in India. And basically he rented a plot of land and he tilled it and he grew these crops and then he tried to sell it in the market to find out where the bottlenecks were, what the problems were. And he was describing to us the numerous levels of intermediaries that are just sucking out the value in the chain so th and the disconnect that the farmer has with the end consumer. They just make, they just grow crop with no idea whether the consumer wants it, whether it's something they would buy, whether, and, and they just hope to sell as quickly as possible. So this guy has an idea how he could break that chain, that, that, uh, that, that those sort of layers of, of uh, intermediaries. But what he needs is cold storage. He needs to have a chance of, of getting the farmers to be able to store the goods so that they can, they can get chilies fresh to the market uh, rather than having ones that decay quickly in the fridge. He told the story about his wife. Uh, he bought some chilies in the countryside, gave it to his wife to use. And then she came back about a week later and said, these are magic chilies because they don't, they don't deteriorate. <laughs> and he said, it's because you're chilling them at the right time, then it's not being you know, chilled at the wrong time. Um, and so we're looking for people like that to help us uh, get our product to the market, meaning our raw materials to go to a cold storage to get to market, and in that way, maybe break that chain, uh, or, 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 or at least shift the balance of power away a little bit. He may need cold storage in villages. He's talking about uh, cold storage uh, transportation. If we can help with that, that would be great. But we need someone to, to that's the missing piece of the puzzle for us. Um, so maybe, I don't know if that answers your question a little bit, but that's probably what we're looking for, partners like that. These are sort of wrap up, uh, yeah. Um, I, I live in Manhattan, and um, there's a tunnel called the Lincoln Tunnel. And I always, when I'm stuck in traffic there, you see thousands and thousands of cars <coughs> trying to si funnel into two lanes and I think of the car that I'm in as a pair of glasses, the guy next to me <laughs> as a cook stove, the guy next to me as a water filter, and you have all these wonderful innovations, all these things that are trying to get to the customer, which is Manhattan, and you got two freaking lanes that are making us all sort of jam up. And what my wish is, my hope is, is that the governments and the multilateral institutions and the giant foundations stop putting all their emphasis and, and resources into the next widget and start figuring out how to make a 14-lane Lincoln Tunnel mm -hmm. and to open up those supply chains so all those wonderful innovations can get through them. And there's just a dearth of resources and attention to that, that problem. And if we keep getting these wonderful innovations that can't get there, then so what? And so that's, that's my hope is that we start putting more time, <laughs> yeah, more, more time into it and, and, and resources into that. For us, I'm looking forward to the day, hopefully soon, when we have mobile banking, and, or when we have banks, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, and uh, mobile phones and, um, and roads instead of ox cart paths. So it's, um, it's kind of a simple request. But that, I mean, that's our biggest challenge is infrastructure. Um, and, and I think for, for us in Myanmar, we're very country specific. Um, when we do hit up against these macro constraints, we do get involved in macro policy in really in pushing and advocating at the top levels. Great. Three quick thank yous. Uh, thank you to Brittany and her team for putting on uh, this session, which I enjoyed enormously. Thank you all for your contributions, your questions, observations and insights. And most important of all, thank you to our four wonderful panelists.
Uh, I feel very hopeful for large amounts of future tunneling uh, <laughs> led by Jordan um, in Manhattan and elsewhere. Um, there's clearly huge amounts of insight, expertise, and experience on delivery to the base of the pyramid out there. I think the challenge for us is to gather it all up and disseminate it. So um, I thank you all for your contributions and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the forum. <laughs>